right, hello, and welcome to our St. Patrick's Day Lunch and Learn. As you remember, the Lunch and Learn series is sponsored by A.T. Still University's Department of Information Technology, and we are co-sponsoring with uh, the ATSU Human Resources Department, so uh, that's a good thing. I'm Brian Krusniak, and thanks for joining us once again for the show that shares information, tips, techniques, and trivia about what is going on at ATSU. So I mentioned that we're co-sponsoring with HR, and as part of that, I would like to welcome our show's new co-host, Mr. Joe Vincent from <laughs> HR. I'm here. I'm here. I'm glad to be here. Uh, and as part of uh, my compliance uh, mandate, I have made sure that all of us are in compliance with uh, traditional wearing green. I'm a little worried about a couple of you. Uh, <laughs> the discrimination policy the does protect lower. you to some extent, but we just wanted to make sure nice. uh, that everybody was, was geared up and protected as we move so forward. So Joe's, Joe's going to get the reputation of the uh, giveaway guy. Yeah, yeah, I'm good with that. All right, good. <laughs> so we have another great show. Um, interesting material for our Break to Educate this week. We're going to discuss Adobe Forms, and we've got uh, Beth live uh, in studio with us for that. So that'll be a great topic. And then we also have a couple of uh, tips from Danny Fladhammer for our iOS. And then our main topic for today revolves around sponsored programs. And before I introduce uh, our guests for this week, I want to make sure that I invite you all to participate live with us. So please uh, include your comments, questions, and thoughts in the live stream chat window. Um, we really like that feedback to come in. It, it helps the, the people um, kind of get more excited about what's going on, what they're presenting, give some feedback. Um, so ask your questions there. We'll gather them up throughout the show and then pass them along for discussion afterward. So let's go ahead and get started. Our guests for today are to my left, uh, Ms. Gayla Sublette, the Associate Vice President for Sponsored Programs. And then on my far right, if we swing the camera around, we have Michelle Mollick who is the Director of Sponsored Programs for the Missouri Campus, and then Carrie Gaines, the Director of Post-Award Compliance and Management. So we've got a good team with us, and we'll meet Beth uh, in a few minutes. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. And I think, really, to start, we're going to start with uh, Gayla. And if you could just kind of give us a sense of kind of the definition of a sponsored program, who sponsored program serves, and then I think we've got some slides to kind of go along with that. So. Okay, great. If we um, can, bring up the slides. Yeah, we're, we're here to talk about grants, all things grants related. We're going to put all grant topics on the table and hopefully have a really good informative session. Um, basically, a sponsored program is uh, a grant that is awarded by an agency to ATSU, uh, mainly to a principal investigator or a project director, and it's to fund a program, um, sometimes innovative research, innovative academic programs, scholarly activity and the like. And basically, there are a lot of deliverables that come along with a grant. And uh, basically, we perform a project and then give the outcomes back to the funder. And so that's kind of the general definition of a grant. And in terms of our service audience, um, we in sponsored programs, we're here to serve, um, our primary service audience would be faculty. Faculty and deans, we work primarily with. And there are lead uh, principal investigators and uh, project directors on grant applications. But we also work with other departments, um, any full-time staff member who might be interested in pursuing a grant. Um, so we're basically here to serve that audience. But our ultimate service audience would be um, our funders, our sponsors, because we want to keep them happy. We want to make sure that ATSU has a strong reputation with our funders. And I have to say that we actually do have a strong reputation and strong um, relationships. So we as a university are in good shape in that sense. So yeah, we brought with us today uh, basically a PowerPoint to go over just in general what we do as a, a, an office. Then Michelle's going to talk specifically about pre-award services. And then Carrie's going to talk about the very exciting post-award <laughs> area of good. compliance. And oh, we're just going to get into all sorts of details. Good. So we'll kind of use the PowerPoint presentation to kind of structure things. But feel free if you guys want to jump in with any questions or thoughts, then let's go ahead and do that too. That'd be great. OK, um, so we'll go to the PowerPoint. Um, basically, what we want to uh, say about um, SP, sponsored programs, is that we're a full service department. Uh, we're really focused in on service. We uh, help um, and we serve both campuses and our online programs. We serve all six schools and every other program within uh, the university. So uh, we're a full service department. Uh, we're very uh, university-wide 
um, oriented, uh, we're global thinkers, and we serve the entire university, so we want to make sure to get that out there. Right. Structure-wise? Structure-wise, we are um, positioned within the Department of Research, Grants, and Information Systems. Woo-hoo! Woo we report to Dr. Hurd. Woo-hoo! Woo. Um, what a ride. Um, so we're in Regis. Um, we're sponsored programs, and our uh, fellow departments, of course, are IT with Brian Krusniak. Um, research Support is our fellow department with Ken Pamprin heading that up. And then the Still Research Institute uh, that's headed up by Brian Dagenhart, and we all report to Dr. Hurd. So that's where you can find us within the structure. Now this is um, a PowerPoint of our organizational chart for sponsored programs, or SP, I'm going to say throughout the presentation. On the right side of this um, organizational chart is our award-winning pre-award uh, team. And on the right side of this chart is our post-award um, people and also our grants administration experts. Um, so again, we're, we're kind of a soup to nuts type of department. We do everything from pre-award to all the way through post-award and close out. Um, in general, we have about 12 staff members that report all the way up through to me. And then our team actually gets larger when we have funded grants because we hire post-award grant uh, coordinators to help out with specific grants are, that are quite large and require full-time staffing or part-time staffing. So our organizational chart actually gets larger with the more grants that we have. We get smaller with the fewer grants we have, so that way we're, we remain really efficient. Makes sense. Okay, um, again, we're often asked in sponsored programs, what, how can you tell a grant versus a gift? That's a general question, and by the way, there's a policy for that, like there's an app for everything, we have a policy for everything <laughs> in sponsored programs. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Joe can relate. Policy number 20-119 is our proposal classification policy, so you can look it up, but I'll give you the policy uh, in brief right now. Um, an SP type of a grant, the type of grants that we develop and we work on in our office, are um, projects that have more strings attached. There, there's a lot of deliverables that go along with a grant. Um, they usually come more fr uh, from a sponsor or a funder. Um, they have a lot of terms and conditions. They often read like contracts. Uh, they're typically led by an ATSU faculty member or a dean. They have line item budgets. They have defined start and stop dates. They require lots of reporting um, and they require outcomes. So basically the sponsor is hiring us in a way to do a project. They're funding us to do a project. We have to give them a project in exchange for the money for the grant award. Now let's take a look at a gift. Okay, um, a gift has fewer strings attached. And we like gifts. We like gifts. The university loves gifts, and we have university advancement, and they're uh, really good about uh, gifts, and um, basically they, is that my phone? No, oh, I thought I turned that off. I'm sorry. <laughs> my phone's ringing. Um, a gift has uh, fewer strings attached. It's usually from more of a donor. Um, gifts usually support things like endowments, um, construction, capital campaigns. Um, they also fund uh, scholarships and other types of funds. And so that's generally more what a gift does for the university. And, it, it, and again, it has fewer strings attached. Okay. So does that make sense? Makes sense, yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, if you will, I need to brag a little bit on the grants team uh, because we have an incredible track record as a team. And I think that track record translates into success and service to our faculty members. So um, indulge me for just a bit here. Absolutely. Our grants team, um, we have over 700 grant awards to our uh, credit that we've leveraged since 1987. And I'm not sure that there's another grants team in the nation that has that type of, of uh, track record. So there's a lot of experience here uh, waiting to serve our faculty members. Um, with that comes about 80 million in grant funding that our team has helped to leverage for the university over the years, and that's an incredible number. So all combined, we have about 75 years of experience um, in grantsmanship, so again, that's a service to the university that we have. We have experience and expertise. Now here's a big one. Um, our grant approval rate at ATSU is way greater than the national rate. In fact, about 50 to 60 or 70 percent even of our grants that we submit actually get funded, whereas the national rate is more like 10 percent. 
sometimes 15%. I mean, it, it varies a bit, but that's about an average. So we're almost like grant snipers. I mean, I think that, that's <laughs> a fantastic statistic, I think. And do you guys kind of pick and choose a little bit more carefully to kind of focus the resources in? Or we, we, I, I mean, how do you keep that number so high? We keep that number high by doing our research and doing our homework up front. We basically, we dig really deep into grant guidelines and to where we have uh, competitiveness, not just eligibility. I think a lot of institutions and a lot of PIs go after what they're eligible for, but not necessarily what they're competitive sure. for. So we do a lot of research on the front end to try to figure out what is mission specific, where do we have a competitive advantage, and then we help to prepare you know, co competent applications uh, for those types of funding sources. And a lot of times our, fund, uh, our proposals actually score at the highest in the nation, uh, oftentimes. So you know, we really do pinpoint and do our research up front, and then we spend the time that's necessary to do a good proposal. Great. So I think we have a winning combination with our faculty and with our team here. Um, the next statistic is really important to me. It's a return on investment of our team to ATSU. And our return on investment is about a five to one ratio, meaning that our team helps to bring in about five uh, dollars in grant funding for every dollar we cost to be here. So it's really important, I think, that we're not a drain on tuition dollars and our team works really hard to make sure to bring value to the university uh, through um, securing extramural grant funding. And so that's an, a really important, uh, as a business major, ROI uh, is really important to me and to our team. Okay, so um, next up, we have about 100 deadlines on our schedule every year. So we're mu very much a deadline-oriented office. Um, we're type A personalities, we're really, uh, um, we're, we're, we, focus heavily on details, and that's um, really important in a deadline office. I so think that's probably what it takes to be so successful. And we kind of like it. We are energized by deadlines, so we hire the right kind of people, too. So that works well with <laughs> IT people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you can relate. Um, we have a lot of acronyms in our uh, business, like a lot of offices and a lot of areas of um, like ours. So some of the common acronyms, especially that we'll be using in the presentation today, would be PI, that stands for Principal Investigator, that's a faculty member who leads a research proposal. We have PD, we use a lot, that's a project director, and again, usually a faculty member who leads a non-research proposal. And um, we'll talk a lot about HRSA, the last one on the list, which is the Health Resources and Services Administration, and we'll talk about that a lot because that's one of ATSU's major funders. It's a federal office. So tell, talk to us about funding. Okay. Um, ATSU grant funding sources, um, basically we have um, about four million in grant dollars that came into ATSU last fiscal year, and it's usually between four and five million dollars annually that comes into the university. Um, last year, 410,000 of that was given out via internal grants, and those internal grants are supposed to help uh, in terms of developing pilot data and preliminary uh, data to go after external funding. So again, there's a return on investment intended with the internal grants as well. So it's kind of like seeding. Seed money, yep. exactly, is what it is. Okay? Great. And again, most of our grant funding is uh, from the federal uh, government. I'm, I might want to add, um, lately we've had a lot from Missouri Foundation, but I'll talk again about that in a few minutes. So last fiscal year, um, People often ask us, how many grants do we have going on in a given year? And it's usually between um, 40 and 50 grants uh, per year. One thing I want to mention here is that about 80% of the funding that we bring in at ATSU is actually for educational grants. Um, curriculum development, curriculum enhancement, faculty development, those kind of things. Whereas 20% um, or so of the grant dollars that come in actually fund research. Um, and most people would probably guess the opposite. But, uh, so most of our grants are actually scholarly, educational type grants. But we think research is actually one of our biggest areas of potential growth. We have uh, practice-based research networks being developed. Um, the Still Research Institute is uh, generating a lot of um, funding. And so we see that as a lot of growth potential um, in terms of clinical and basic science research. Um, so right. wanted to point that out. Here's some interesting grant facts. I hope they're interesting. Um, 
What's our largest university funder? Um, that would be um, recently the Missouri Foundation for Health, which has been very generous in helping to start up uh, MOSDO, both here and the St. Louis Clinic. So um, we're really appreciative of our Missouri Foundation for Health and its funding lately. Um, also, again, I, I mentioned HRSA earlier, and HRSA tends to be our largest federal funder. Although, other key funders include the National Institutes of Health, other foundations, like we've had uh, foundation funding from the very prestigious Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, and the like. And we also get a little bit of state money, but not a lot because we're a private institution. But we still get a little bit when it's opened up to public and private funding. So that's basically where uh, we get most of our money from uh, as a university. Oh, could we go back one more? Oh, sorry. Um, the largest cumulative grant ever at ATSU, a lot of times people will ask that, and it's the Missouri AHAC. Um, we've had $26 million to date from the Missouri AHAC, um, and just as a side note, that was the first grant I ever worked on back in the 80s. Big hair, you know, in the, day, the time. Um, so it was an incredible start to an exciting career, to say the least. And so uh, a lot of kudos go to our AHEC staff and Janet and Mike for leading up that incredible project. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, the grants team, again, our purpose is basically to advance ATSU's mission by helping to bring in external dollars that help support that mission. Um, our ultimate service audience I mentioned up front would be our sponsors, the people who actually give us our money, funders, and give us grant awards. Our uh, internal service audience, our primary audience, would be, again, our deans and our faculty members. Um, our secondary internal uh, service audience would be other departments that are outside the academic branch, including the museum, uh, still Research Institute, again, the AHEC I mentioned, and other uh, vice presidents, administrators, and full-time staff members. Um, and again, SP helps to advance innovative and scholarly projects. Basically, that's what we do. Okay, um, this slide is um, really depicts the type of model that we have here at ATSU in terms of sponsored programs. And we have a very unique model, and I think one that's of interest to other schools that are about our size and other osteopathic institutions as well. Um, basically, what this chart represents is that we're a full service model. We're both centralized, yet we do departmental and school work. We are pre-award experts, but we're also post-award experts. We process everything um, in terms of grants. We centralize all of our files and data and statistics, and basically we manage all of that. So again, we're a full service model. We do it all. So uh, basically, to summarize uh, my part, um, our team strategy is to maximize grant funding for the university by working with our uh, PIs and PDs. And then also, we want to educate um, our service um, and our, uh, educate and serve our deans and faculty members in all things uh, grantsmanship. And so being here today helps us do that. So we want to thank, thank you for the invitation. Great. Well, that's a great overview. Yeah. So I think with that, let's kind of shift gears a little bit and go more specifically into the pre-award area. Maybe Joe, you can kind of guide Michelle through some of that. Well, yeah, I'm just <clears throat> I'm really interested because you are the pre-award expert, is what we've been hearing well, we from over here on this side <laughs> of the table. <laughs> You're like the queen Pressure. of the pre-award experts, uh, and full service means a lot. I have no idea what that means, but you're going to tell us. Well, I'll do my best. Okay, um, good. I Take it away. It's important to, to point out since we do serve all six schools. Um, we have pre-award staff who are on uh, the Arizona campus, and then also um, we have Julie Bauer Cook in, in Illinois. So we have a great pre-award team of eight that, that works to serve all of our schools. Um, and pre-award services are very much customized to each PI or PD. Remember, that was principal investigator, project director, so the PI, PD. And where they're coming to us in their process. And clearly, the earlier they're coming to us, the better. <laughs> so we can plan ahead. But we have a range of services um, that involve locating and, and evaluating potential funding sources, interpreting the grant guidelines. Um, we assist with the development of budgets, so writing narratives um, or assisting with writing those, acting as a liaison between a funder and our PIPD. Um, and additionally, I think it's important for everyone to know that all proposals that are submitted for ATSU come through our centralized office. So um, 
and additionally, since we don't have a clinical trials office uh, within ATSU, all clinical trials work comes through <laughs> the SP office as well. So remember, though, it's really key that the work that we're doing is trying to secure extramural support for ATSU. Um, and so any way that we can create efficiencies to do that, that's uh, a lot of what our pre-award team is about. Um, in terms of uh, those specific services, I think locating sources is one thing that a lot of faculty are interested in. They have a great project idea, but they're just really not sure if it's fundable or who might be interested in, in investing in it. So we spend a great deal of time researching funders and monitoring uh, their changing interests, monitoring the trends in healthcare and education and research and how things are shifting and if those align better at one point in time than another for ATSU. So in doing that, we're routinely scanning about 40 uh, funding listservs, uh, commercial funding databases, online sources, all the time to try to keep up and make sure that we're looking at the things that are on our faculty and administrator you know, radar and, and keeping abreast of those. In the spirit of St. Patrick's Day, you're looking for the pots of gold. You betcha. <laughs> and we're looking for the attainable pots of gold. <laughs> Short rainbows. <laughs> um, in terms of evaluating, I think Gayla mentioned before that um, we spend a lot of time making sure that those that we're going after are really attainable. Um, and so our research and analysis aims at finding the matches between a funder and ATSU. And that may be organizational compatibility, geographic compatibility, a mission match, um, and, and the whole issue, is it a gift or is it an exchange transaction grant? So we're always evaluating those sorts of things. And we take that information when we dig in deep on an opportunity and put it into a funding opportunity summary, an FOS. And this is a, a best practice that Gala and, and my predecessors have developed over the years. It's an internal decision-making tool that summarizes those massive guidelines into two pages or less. And we try to highlight what are the deal breakers? You know, where is their good match? Are we eligible but not really competitive? Um, and lining out all of those things so that, number one, when we pass that to a faculty, dean, administrator, it's a good, it saves them time and energy in making the decision, is this something we should pursue? I think that saving time and frustration is, is um, key to us trying to communicate in two pages if this is a good idea or not. Um, and um, we do about 200 reviews every year on our pre-award team. So it's, it's a massive amount of digging deep to try to make sure that those that we do pursue are, are really the best ones that we should be, should be running for. Um, proposal development, so we will do the, the um, locating and the evaluating and then when we find that there's a good match, um, that's when we really want to sit down with a PIPD and figure out how do we go about approaching this proposal development. Um, one of the first things that we want to do is set a timeline for all the milestones because we plan ahead, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that about you guys. Yes. <laughs> all of the milestones that are going to get us to the finish line um, in, a, in the best way possible. Um, we want to make sure that our PIs and PDs are spending the most amount of their time in their expertise area and that our SP staff is spending our time on the technical expertise and the wraparound sections and making sure that we're pulling a proposal together it not only reads well, but it meets all the funders' guidelines and it meets ATSU compliance and regulatory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's a big part of our pre-award team um, goals in, in helping to put proposals together. Um, and then development toolkit. So in addition to our staff, there are a number of other resources that are available to investigators and project directors um, within ATSU. And, you know, as they're listed here, we, we have the funding opportunity summaries we talked about. We also have the ATSU grant submission manual, and this is kind of a step-by-step -step that walks someone through what are all the, the processes and the, the forms and the, the resources that you could access. This is available on the portal. Uh, if you go to um, departments and sponsored programs, you can get to the submission manual and a number of these other tools there. So worksheets and checklists and templates and all sorts of things. You can also access all of those by contacting any of our pre-award staff. Great. So, um, I've got just a few more things that I want to mention on the pre-award side. Um, proposals at ATSU 
can't be submitted in a vacuum. We mentioned before that we're a centralized submission office, so they do all need to come through our office at some point. Um, all submissions have to clear an internal review process. And um, we generally use uh, an, inter an internal approval form that helps to facilitate that. The review process really honors the chain of command and then also reinforces all those internal controls. So you'll see there's five main components listed on the slide that are part of the IAF. And it's you know summary information and disclosures if that PI or PD has a significant financial interest in the project or in the funder. Um, departmental review, so we know everybody's clear on, on uh, faculty assignments and whether you have time to pursue the project. And the uh, regulatory compliance review, and this is really important because it talks about the use of human subjects in your project, uh, the use of animals, or the use of biohazardous materials. So we, every proposal has to be screened against the regulatory compliance review. And then finally, the administrative review, review involves approval by the academic officers or the divisional vice president. So honoring the chain of command and making sure that we're, we're going through um, all the right channels and mitigating any problems that possibly could <laughs> pop up in post-award to the best of our dear ability <laughs> on the pre-award side. So, um, there, Gayla mentioned that there are some internal grant opportunities. Uh, this is the seed money that um, is available within ATSU to start some projects. Uh, we see that some uh, faculty members really would rather get their feet wet kind of on an internal proposal and gear up and, and then um, be more prepared to compete on the national level. I should say that the internal funding um, is due on April 1st and there are a number of different opportunities that are listed on the slide. These are also available, uh, information about all of these available on the portal. So again, departments, SP. Um, and I have to say, because it's internal and our, our pre-award team is aimed at securing external dollars. These aren't grants that our team can help you with in the writing, um, but we can certainly give you, again, all those tools. So the, the last thing is you probably got a funding or got a Grants in You newsletter alert um, recently. Uh, March 6th was our last one. This is a way that Sponsored Programs tries to stay in good communication with our full campus about who has recently applied for a grant, who's recently been funded <laughs> for a grant. Um, and other tips of tips and tools um, in grant preparation. So I think that kind of sums up what I had on the pre-award side. Awesome. Joe, you got questions, right? <laughs> I just want to make sure I was clear that for uh, running the ship, you guys run a tight ship, you're all very prepared, and you want applications by April Fool's Day? Am I clear? <laughs> Dr. Heard does. Okay, all right. I mean, I just thought maybe that was some kind of joke. I don't know. Dr. It does. was good. It was good. <laughs> I appreciate that. You bet. Cool. Thanks. Hey, uh, so if I'm looking at my schedule right, this is a good time for us to break. Uh, and we're going to go take a look at the current happenings going on at ATSU. And we're going to come back with Gayla and Carrie. And they're going to talk a little bit more about the equally scintillating <laughs> post awards uh, process with the post award expert. No pressure. All right, let's go to, let's go to happenings. to another iOS tip. My name is Danny Flathammer and today we are going to go over an app called Find an iPhone or Find My iPhone. Now this is a really cool app and it is does not come pre-installed on any iOS or Mac device. Uh, you will need your own iCloud account and that will be for another day but if you do have an iCloud account with Apple if you like this app, just go to the App Store. I'll let that load up, and then we're going to type in Find, and usually you'll see it all above. You'll see the first one, Find My iPhone app, and just go ahead and download the app. Once downloaded, we're going to close out. We're going to go over, and you'll see the app open up. Now the one thing you want to make sure about to make sure your devices show up, we're actually going to exit out now and we're going to go into settings real quick. So 
Under settings, you'll scroll down a little bit, you'll see iCloud, and you'll want to make sure you have your account all set up. When you do, scroll to the bottom, you will see a Find My iPad or iPhone, uh, whichever iOS device you're using, and you just want to make sure that that is on, and go ahead and click that on. So I'm going to close out, I'm going to scroll over back to Find My iPhone, and what's great about this app is that it will find all of your devices for you, which is neat. So if I can scroll in here, I can see my computer, my iPad, and for some reason my phone shows that it is at home. So that means I forgot my phone today. That's okay. So, but what's really also neat is, so for example, I'm going to choose Proton Pack. That's my iPad. And on the bottom, you're going to see a few buttons that look like a car, actions, and info button. So the info, kind of what's nice is it shows that I'm signed in under mine. It shows I can show different ways of the map. So I can get a good idea where my iPad is. Under actions, I can play a sound in case I've lost it, like in my house or anything of that nature. I can turn on lost mode so that way it will lock it. I can also erase my iPad, that way I don't have to worry about any of my info being stolen. So, just close out on that. And that's a quick tutorial on Find My iPhone. I highly recommend downloading the app, signing up for the account, it's free to sign up. I'd recommend doing this just in case you ever lose your phone, your iPad, your computer, because then you'll be able to locate it exactly where it is, or you'll be able to erase your iPad or iPhone just in case of certain scenarios. So, well, this has been another tutorial from iOS Tip. If you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you. All right, welcome back. So, so Joe, I, I do have to point out since this is our <laughs> yeah. first time co-hosting uh, that you did not read the schedule. That's right. painful. <laughs> it really it hurts me, but I appreciate. We actually it. went to the iOS <laughs> Tip, so that was great information. Um, we all, I shouldn't say we all, I will just speak for myself. I frequently misplace my iPad, and so that is great information on how to try and find it. Um, we're going to come back real quick and uh, talk a little bit about Post Award with Kerry Gaines. Um, I want to remind everyone, though, that uh, please send in your questions, and we'll try and get to those toward the end. And with that, um, Kerry, tell us a little bit about what some of the Post Award um, requirements are. Well, as Michelle pointed out, Sponsor programs, both the pre-award and the post-award team, really strives to focus on the technical aspects of grants management, grants compliance, and the pre-award. And that allows our project directors and principal investigators to really focus in their areas of expertise. The post-award team has three primary service goals, and those are to assist the project of, uh, directors and principal investigators with program startup, implementation, and closeout. We want to provide the necessary programmatic and fiscal monitoring and compliance. And we also assist with the proactive management of grant funding to position ATSU to receive future funding. Funding. So really everything we do, even in the post-award, is geared back towards securing additional funding. So is it too much to say you guys are the police force? <laughs> no, it probably isn't. <laughs> um, I, I wish there was a better way to say it, but we really do try to, to really proactively manage those funds um, to keep everyone out of hot water. So, great news, after weeks or maybe even months of waiting, um, the project directors or investigators get a notice of award. And when that happens, our Director of Grants Administration, Sarah Smitzer, um, kicks in our post-award services and helps with program startup. So she'll assist with the staffing, she'll help secure institutional approvals for award acceptance. That's another thing that I think people sometimes um, miss or misinterpret. There is a formalized process for accepting an award that comes to ATSU. So we want to make sure that we have all of our regulatory certifications and assurances in place. We review and confirm those terms and conditions of the award to make sure we're getting into what we thought we were getting into. And um, if there's any budget negotiations that need to happen, Sarah will work with the PI and the funding source to, to solidify those. And she also works with the controller's office for grant account setup, and she initiates any of the time and effort reporting that's gonna go along with that project, if, if we have staffing that are paid for through that program. 
Um, she also takes all of that information, so the pre-award team, you know, goes for the grants, we get it in, and then she takes all that information and puts it into our database, which is our centralized information clearinghouse for the university. And she also helps to update the, um, the Grants and You newsletter to recognize the folks that receive those awards. I think it's an important thing. You know, I think sometimes we think that once the grant is awarded, it's over. <laughs> really, that's kind of when the, yeah. the work begins, right? Right. It, I mean, that, that's truly when the work yeah. begins, and that's why it's so important, um, as Michelle pointed out, that our pre-award team spends the time up front and making sure that it is a good match, because the worst thing in the world is receiving funding that isn't relevant to the university. Right. It never works. Or if it does work, it's very painful. <laughs> so, um, once the award is established, the post-award team is available to assist our project directors with program implementation. Again, mirroring, mirroring what Michelle said, we meet the project directors and principal investigators where they are. Um, we try to tailor our services to their needs specifically. But we can assist with operationalizing project activities into an implementation plan. Uh, we assign and rotate trained post-award coordinators among the funded projects. So if somebody needs more one-on-one -on -one time or more assistance with their program, we do that. We also act as a liaison between the sponsors, the project directors, any external partners we might have, consultants, contractors, that type of thing, and our internal uh, partners like the controller's office and HR, that type of thing. So, We also um, take the time to learn, manage, and monitor the funding source electronic systems. Many of our funding sources, even foundations, are going to electronic reporting systems. So there's the HERSA EHB, the ERA Commons, which the NIH operates through, the National Science Foundation FASTLANE, grants.gov. So those are very time-consuming elements of award management. So we make sure that our post-award team is well-versed in those. We work with the project directors um, and principal investigators to complete progress and performance reports. Same with the financial status reports. Um, and we also try to assist um, with identifying and addressing any barriers and challenges in program implementation. Projects rarely go off exactly the way they were written. So we try to be available to make sure that our, our program directors and, and principal investigators get the support they need. When, when I look at the list of the electronic systems that you guys use, <laughs> I think the reason that research grants and IT are together is because we both like acronyms so much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, once we get through the program implementation, the project's been implemented, we did what we said we would do, most of the time we're excited to report that ATSU often exceeds its, uh, per their performance indicators, the programs at ATSU um, really do well. And we like to help the project directors with the program closeout. So that would be any final reporting, account and file closeout, dissemination and data sharing, and then we also monitor the projects for record retention. So our third area of service is compliance and support monitoring. And the sponsor programs team assumes the responsibility for synthesizing the grant terms and condition, conditions, the funding source policies, federal regulations and statutes, and then our own policies to ensure that the grants are administered in a compliant manner. So there's a, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes in an award, and we try to assume the responsibility for these things so the project directors and principal investigators can focus on their projects, the programmatic aspects. We also monitor the projects for programmatic and fiscal compliance. Did you already cover all of this? Yeah, like no, I'm, this I'm gonna talk about. So the compliance support and monitoring piece is pretty huge. Um, com compliance issues and compliance monitoring, those regulations are growing every day. So we rut routinely monitor the funder guidelines, regulations, and statutes for changes and updates. We participate in all funder trainings and technical assistance offerings that are relevant to our current projects and anything that we might be going for in the future. Everyone on the sponsor programs team maintains memberships to professional organizations. We participate in conferences. We try to identify any of those emerging best practices in award compliance and management. And Joe can attest to this, we recently completed a compliance self-study. 
specific to the Office of Management and <laughs> Management and Budgets. I've been wanting to do that for like <laughs> minutes. Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did the, the compliance self-study um, for the new uniform guidance for grants and that went into effect on December 26th and the, com the compliance self-study involved so many different departments and teams at ATSU. It's been a real um, challenge. <laughs> So uh, that's great. So we've heard a little bit about pre, we've heard a little bit about post. Uh, Gayla, maybe we can come back to you and kind of bring us full circle. Sure. Um, to summarize, sure. we in SP, um, we're here to help with all things grants related from, you know, the initial idea to all the way through closeout. Um, all things grants related is what we're all about. And so we encourage our faculty, our deans, and others interested in pursuing grants to contact us often and early. Um, and make sure that we can work with you in terms of uh, seeking grant funding. So we're here to help, and we consider ourselves a service department. So um, basically wanted to also remind everybody we are on the portal. Um, we have a lot of resources out there on the portal, uh, proposal development worksheets, our manuals, uh, funding sources, ideas, thoughts, and, and whatnot. Um, but we're also, um, we wanted to let you know, we're available on site on both the Kirksville campus and the Mesa campus. In Kirksville, our office is in Memorial Hall, middle floor. And then in Mesa, we're in building 5835, <laughs> which is um, located close to the ASDO admin offices. I think everybody knows right behind the clinic there. Um, in the Ashes suite. So that's where our uh, team in Mesa is located. So call us, contact us, stop by. Um, we just encourage a lot of dialogue and we look forward to serving the university as things go forward. Excellent, thank you guys so much. Yeah. We're going to go to another quick break. Um, before we do, I wanna make sure that you guys, again, get any questions in. Um, I think the sponsored programs people will be around for a little bit to answer any questions that happen to come in. Sure. Um, we'll go to a quick break and hear about what's going on at ATSU and then we'll come back with uh, Beth Thompson in studio. So now is what's happening. That's right. That was busy, lots going on. 
I think I'm going to head down to Mesa for the uh, chair massage thing if you want to go. We're going <laughs> to so do not that fair. later on. So yeah, not fair. I know. I know. We're not going to dwell on it. Um, <laughs> what we are going to dwell on is a subject, though, that is equally perplexing to me. In fact, you and I were chatting about it during the thing, and mm -hmm. I, my blood pressure is up significantly already. Of course. Uh, but before we go there, uh, again, as the one of the compliance <laughs> officials for ATSU, yes. you need to have that on. Yes. Uh, even though you're greenish, I've noticed there's been a lot of greenish. <laughs> I feel like that's testing the limits of the international custom. Uh, so now you're green, and you're here. This is Beth, by the mm -hmm. way. Beth. Uh, Beth is here to talk to us about Adobe Forms, yes. something that a lot of us have the capability to create and use, and they're very convenient, but they can be also very frustrating if you mm -hmm. don't know how to use them. Correct. Right. So help. Beth. <laughs> okay. When, uh, when I was asked to do this, I was asked, you know, what topic do people want? And inevitably, it was Adobe Forms. I can't make an Adobe Form. And Adobe Forms do have a learning curve. So I'm going to go through a few things today that maybe will help you avoid some of the pitfalls that you may face. Um, one thing people don't understand is to create an Adobe Form, you actually need three documents when you're done. You start off with a Word document that you create your basic background, the text of it. Once you have that, then you use Adobe Acrobat, and I want to make that very clear, Acrobat, not Reader, to actually convert it to PDF. Once you do that, then you can start creating your form. Now, I'm going to be screen sharing here if the technology works, so we got to wait to see. Hey, yay, it's working. Um, so I've already done that. I've already created the basic PDF form, and now we can start adding our pieces. Now I want to see if this one works. I may, it may be on your computer. I wonder if it's my computer, in which case I'm going to start typing messages. <laughs> okay, um, which computer do you want to try that one? The joys of, nope, it's not working on either of them, Corey. Who else would be making an Adobe form right now? Okay, okay, good. <laughs> so let's see who else. Okay, yep, it is on yours. It's mine. Here, do you want my computer? Yes, please. You want to switch spots? Let's please. Let's do that. All right, we're, this is we're, like we're a, really... we're going to do like a little Irish jig <laughs> chair changing thing. Sorry about this. The joys of technology is they never work. We're going to have to do a B2E on <laughs> making the studio thing work. All right. So I've added a text box. Now, when you first add a text field, it gives you a couple of options. It gives you the option to name it. Um, so I can name this name. And you can decide if you want to make it required or not. If it make it required, it turns bright red. And people know that they have to type in something there or they can't move on. What people don't know is you can go beyond just the box. <laughs> you can double click on it. Or you can hit Control-I. That's the big shortcut in Adobe, Control-I. That will give you your properties. You can add a tooltip. For example, please type in your name. What the tooltip does is when you roll over the box, that will tell you what you're supposed to do. So if you ever see that in a field, that's where it comes. You can make it visible or invisible. Why you would want to make it invisible, I don't know. <laughs> um, and you can make it read only. Now, I know that seems a little bit odd, but with Adobe Forms, you can actually add calculations. Um, many of you have filled out your vacation forms where it, you type in the number of hours and it automatically adds. So in that automatic add one, you don't want people to overwrite your pretty functions and formulas. You make it read only. Appearance, you can change the color of the border, you can change the color of the background, you can change the font. Now this is where I always use a lot of caution with people. Just because you can make it pretty does not mean you should. Oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> the biggest thing with the pretty in Adobe is it drastically increases the file size. So the more you change the fonts, the more you change the colors, the bigger and bigger your file size gets. So you want to be careful of that. Um, I'm going to skip over here to options. Um, if you have a larger text area, you can have it be multi-line, where it actually people can just keep typing and typing and typing, or you can have it scroll or both. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know what rich text formatting is, back in the day, um, you have plain text and rich text. Rich text means that you can make things bold, underlined, italics. If you don't check that, people can just type in, no, they can't make anything bold or whatever. Format. This is a huge one that people don't know about. You can actually change the format of the box to different things. You can make it a number. Again, like I was talking about with the vacation. Oh. Oh, Got to take off this first. Hold on. It's not liking my... All right, here we go. Number. You can have it have a specific number of decimal places. You can have it with a comma, without a comma. You can have it currency. You can have negatives, either being a negative sign or red. And again, when you do a number format, you can actually have other fields that do calculations. We use this a lot with our students when they have to do a peer review, that they have to give a certain number of points, it adds up the points for them. Other and options? And if they get negative points, that's, that's bad. super bad. You can actually format it so that they can't, that there's a range. Um, I've actually worked with um, some people before. In the validate, you can actually limit the range. So you can say it has to be a positive number. Right. This is, uh, I've been working with research on one of their forms. They have age as a number, but they're limiting it between the age of 18 and 100 so they can get better results. Go back to my options, format here. You could also do percentage, pretty self-explanatory. Date. If you want your dates in a certain format, you can pick any of these, M is month, D is day, Y is year. So you can pick whatever format you want. Gives you a little example down here so you can see how it works. Especially for data consistency, that's a very helpful thing. Same thing with time, if you want to do a specific time. Um, special, this is very helpful if you're doing very specific forms like zip codes, phone numbers. It allows people to enter just the numbers without worrying about the symbols or whatever. So with phone number, if you don't want people to have to worry about putting a dash in between or a period in between, use this phone number and it will do it automatically for you. Some of the more advanced options, again, the validate I showed you earlier. But you can also do calculations where you can add, subtract, multiply the different fields. That's really helpful for, for numeric. So those are some of the basics around the text field. There's also checked box and radio buttons. And I always get the question, what's the difference? A check box is an independent box. You just create a box, and there it is. It's a little checkbox. Again, we can go to the properties, a few less properties than the other. But the one people don't know about is the options. You can choose how you want your checkbox to look. Do you want it to have a little check in it? Do you want it to have a circle in the middle? Cross is the most common. That's the little X through it. Most people prefer that. But you could also have diamond, square, or star. Check boxes always default to check, so that's going to be your default anyway. I'm going to change it to cross so people can see what that looks like. Um, you can have it do an action, so if they check it, it pops to another menu or something like that. Again, that's a very advanced feature. And again, you can change the color, border, what have you. Difference is with a radio button, a radio button creates a group. Now here's where you need to be careful. People forget this, they just click a radio and then move on. But it gives you the big warning, warning. You have to have at least two buttons. If you're really good with Adobe Forms, you can figure out how to add more buttons to your radio later. If you're not, make sure you're just keeping the add number, add a button until you're done. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, to go back. I'm going to go into preview here for a second. So here's our checkbox that we did X. With the radio button, it's one or the other. So if you pick one, the others automatically turn off. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Checkboxes, you can check as many as you want, but 
the radio, it's one only. Also, you can change individually the buttons to be different. So this radio button could be a cross, this one could be a circle, this one could be a diamond. But if you wanted to group them and select them all, you can, again, control I, change it for all of them. So I'm going to make it a star. I never tried the star before, so we'll see what that looks like. There we go. Mm -hmm. So you, by selecting multiple fields at the same time, you can change the properties for all of them. That applies to the text boxes, the check boxes, everything. Another one that's very useful is the drop-down menu. A lot of people like that for things like, I want a date, so it's January, February, March, April, May. You know, those things that you want to are automatically populate. Again, go into the properties. In options is where you can add your choices. So I can say Monday, add, Tuesday, add, Wednesday. Now notice every time I'm adding a new one, that's what's showing up in the box. What most people don't know is whatever in the item list you have highlighted when you create your box, that is the default. So whatever you want as a default, that's the one that you want to have highlighted. You can move things up and down in your list. If you want them sorted alphabetically, want to add something in, you can sort them. You can sort them. You can add allow, allow people to type in something of their own if they don't like what you put. That's another option. Again, you can change it to be, drop downs can be numbers. They can have the colors and fonts changed. So you have a lot of those options across the board. Final one I'm going to show you today, and again, I'm only doing some of the basics because of time, is the signature field. Um, a lot of you know that forms can have the signature. All to do is add it. It's just click on it. It's a new feature in the new Acrobat. All you have to do is add it like this. Once you've added all of your fields, this is where people don't go to the next step. So you have your Word document that was your original. You have your Acrobat document with all the fields. Save this. Then you have to save it again. You have to save it for reader enabled. If you don't do that, people cannot use it in Adobe Reader. So you always want to make sure you save it as a as reader. In different versions of Adobe, it's in a different spot. In the newest version of Acrobat Pro, it's actually as save as other. And there's the reader extended PDF. That's how you save it. I'm in the tools editing, so it won't let me save it right now. But that's how you would save it. But once you do that, save it as a new name. Because if you need to go back and change something, once that reader version cannot be edited. So make sure that you save the Acrobat version so that in case you need to make a change, you can go back to the Acrobat, make your change, then again, resave it as reader. So make sure, again, three files at all times. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty much the basics. Again, um, yes, we've now switched places. <laughs> um, <laughs> If you have questions on it, please feel free to ask. Um, I work with a lot of people around campus on this. You know, forms are something that it takes a lot of steps, and there are a lot of little nuances. But once you get the hang of it, again, Control I is your friend. You should be able to create some pretty decent forms. Awesome, excellent. Thanks, Beth. I think that's kind of a wrap for today. Um, uh, it's great having someone like Beth, uh, <laughs> you know, available for. Uh, just doing these things that people may, in their normal course of, of the day, uh, have different features or functions that they use frequently, and to be able to share those with everyone else is really great. So thanks, Beth. Appreciate that. I um, want to thank Joe for being our co-host. Um, appreciate having him here. It's a little more fun with uh, two of us rather than just one. And then uh, thanks again to sponsored programs. So. We've got uh, Michelle and Carrie in our live studio <laughs> audience. <laughs> and then thanks again to Gayla uh, for sharing all the information.
excited. To be so here. we'll be back in a couple of weeks with our next Lunch and Learn. Um, until then, thanks and uh, have a great week.